The last few years have been pretty good to the Kansas City Chiefs, what with its multiple Super Bowl championships and a close association with the biggest pop star in the world. But BJ Kissel remembers what it was like to be a fan of the team long before it started regularly winning games. Back in the early 2010s, he began blogging for SB Nation, and he used his success there to eventually land a job as the Kansas City Chiefs in-house reporter. In that role, he did everything from writing web articles to serving as a sidelines correspondent for live game broadcasts. In 2021, he struck off on his own and co-founded the KC Sports Network, a group of podcasts and YouTube channels that cover Kansas City sports. Today, it puts out 10 different shows and is monetized through a mixture of local and national advertisers. In a recent interview, BJ explained why he left his job at the Chiefs, how he convinced local businesses to sponsor his shows, and where he sees new opportunities for growth. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. If you want to listen to an audio version of this show, subscribe to The Business of Content wherever you get your podcasts. By the way, have you ever wondered how I monetize this show? It's entirely reliant on subscriptions to my Substack newsletter. When you subscribe, you're able to book a half hour introductory phone call with me. You also receive subscriber only interviews with some of the world's most successful media entrepreneurs. Support the work I do here by subscribing at simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. And finally, if you're on the lookout for interviews with the world's most successful media entrepreneurs about how they built their businesses, then this is the show for you. So take a few moments to hit the subscribe button down below. Okay, let's jump into the interview. Hey, BJ, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we're here to talk about this media company that you currently run and co-founded. But before that, let's talk a little just about about your history with sports and sports journalism. How did you break into the industry? I was a very non-traditional path. Uh, I think it's kind of the story of a lot of you know creators uh, right now. But when I went to school, you know, it was I went to school for you know, uh, electronic journalism, and it was you know go to a newspaper, start at a small town newspaper, and work your way up in those markets and. Um, when I graduated college with my degree in journalism, my first job out of college wasn't using my degree. Uh, I actually found my way back to it because I, I grew up in Kansas City. I was a diehard Chiefs fan, Kansas City sports fan. And uh, I had moved out to California, took a sales job out there, and I had found a blog, an SB Nation blog called Arrowhead Pride at the time as just a way to interact with other Chiefs fans. As a diehard Chiefs fan, move out to California, I had nobody to talk to. And so I joined this blog and just started commenting as a fan with no thoughts of like doing anything in media because I had a sales job. I had moved kind of away from journalism. And at that point, it had been a few years. I'd worked for a collegiate summer baseball organization for several years right out of college and then took this sales job. And so uh, it the was- The sales job wasn't in sports though. Uh, it was high school fund athletic fundraising. I was the okay, one going so you around- were kind of sp- you were kind of sports adjacent. Then. Yeah, I've so always been like, in sports yeah. in some way or another. Sports have always been a huge part of my life. I grew up playing baseball, basketball, football. I uh, was much better at baseball. I was fortunate, played baseball in college. I uh, wanted to be a baseball broadcaster uh, right out of college. And I think it was my senior year of college. One of my professors, uh, she said, you know, it was the simplest advice. And it actually floored me at the time because I was dumb and wasn't thinking about this. She just said, figure out who you think you want to like somebody that does a job that you think you want. And just figure out how they got there. Like, just study, you know, who they are and how they got to that position. Well, everybody that I which is terrible, which is terrible advice when, like, when you're graduating in like the 2000s, because everybody who got their start was in a completely different media environment. It was a very interesting time. But I looked at everybody that was doing color analysts for baseball as a Hall of Fame player. It's like I'm a a below average college player. Like nobody's going to want to hear my analysis, and I wasn't. Uh, wanting to be like a play-by-play guy or anything. But uh, anyway, yeah, I had moved out. Uh, I was doing high school fundraising out in California and just wanted to interact with other Chiefs fans, found this, what was a community back then before social media and Twitter and X and, and all that ways that you kind of connect with other people. Back then, this was like 2008, it was blogs is the way that we kind of had that community aspect. And so I just started writing fan posts. Uh, just for free yeah, is, and you know, after Nation a while of for, commenting. Well, like SB Nation for context for listeners is that it's like mm-hmm. a, it's a sports network owned by Vox Media. Um, they mm-hmm. have team specific verticals. And so you were, yeah. you were reading the SB Nation blog for the Kansas City Chiefs, right? And you said yes. you started, you started commenting or did they have like a blogging feature where you could start your own blog? What was the, what was the actual so, functionality? 
Yeah, so I started commenting. I read for a while as a lurker, is what they were called, like because you'd have all kinds of traffic, but only uh, a certain number of people would actually get in there and comment. I started to feel comfortable, so I'd write some comments, and then the longer comments you would write, and then if people liked them enough, like they turned green. Uh, so it was like, hey, people like my opinion on this, and so that kind of gave me the the confidence, like, hey, try to write a fan post here. So I would write. And after a while, the editor who is now ended up being a friend of mine and somebody I still stay in touch with, and he's moved up in SB Nation. Uh, but I remember him telling me like, hey, you're a pretty good writer. Do you want to, we can put you on the front page. Now, it wasn't paid. And I know it's kind of a thing now. I, it never bothered me because I was doing it for fun anyway. But it, he got me on the front page. And I remember calling my mom when I was in California. I was like, hey, mom, I got on the front page of this blog. Like that college degree is really coming in handy right now. Uh but and I by just, front page, you mean so SB Nation had some kind of blogging thing. Like I, I know it was a, a, a initially a spinoff of Daily Coast, which allows you to start your own like individual blogs, and then one of the editors can then take your blog and promote it to the front page. Was that the same kind of setup? Yeah, yeah, it was called a fan post. So if you were, any fan or anybody could get in there and write a fan post, that would go over on the side, and if you got enough Rex, it would like pin to the top for a certain number of days. Well, I wrote enough that was that was good enough that people kept hitting Rex. Well, then the, uh, Joel, the guy who ran the site said, Hey, we'll just move you to like the main front page and not off to the side. Like we'll make you a featured contributor, uh, which at that time was awesome. Cause again, I was doing it for fun anyway. And I did that for several years and then it grew from there to not just the blog post. It was like two blog posts and then it was a podcast and then it was, Hey, we're going to do a YouTube channel. Do you want to create content for our YouTube channel? I was doing all these different things back covering a, a bad Kansas city chiefs team at that time. But, uh, Simon, the really cool thing about that particular time and that particular community is we're all covering a bad chiefs team, but there are half dozen to a dozen of us who were all doing this for free for fun in our mid twenties that are now full time doing this. And a lot of them are with us at KC sports network. And we've known each other for 15, 16 years in creating content for free for fun. And then just kind of doing it because we were passionate about it. So you, even when you were doing the podcast and YouTube videos, they still weren't paying you? When they got to that point, I was getting paid. But at that point, I think I, the most I ever got was like 400, 400 bucks a month. And I was probably working 40 hours a week at that time. And so there was definitely uh, conversations with my was girlfriend and fiance and now, now wife at that time of like, hey, this isn't sustainable long term. Like it's a fun side hobby right now. But as we get more serious about, you know, a family and you don't have as much time to do things, uh, some of those conversations uh, had to take place. And luckily I was in the right place at the right time a few times. And I got some really good advice from people um, on how to kind of grow from an outside blogger um, at that time when the industry was changing so much. Um, I got some really good advice, followed it and got very, very lucky. So you were doing your your full-time job 40 hours a week, and then you were spending an additional 40 hours a week, just blogging and podcasting and YouTubing for SB Nation. Yes. And getting, I, and getting paid $400 a month for it. Yeah. And I, I will never forget. And I was not, I, I played football in high school. I was not very good. Uh, I didn't know the X's knows. Didn't when I st started doing content, I love that stuff, but didn't understand the game at that level. And I remember one night by hand, like now it's things that PFF and all these analytic sites do it. Um, and they're much better at it. But I remember charting the chiefs offense by hand after a game. I want to say it was against the bears. And I spent, I was up till six o'clock in the morning after the game, like for 15, 12, 15 hours, like charting all this stuff on a Microsoft Excel. And I found a tendency and it was the first time, like at, at five o'clock in the morning, I was like, oh my God, I found something. It was every time our fullback was lined up high, right. We need a play action pass every single time. And I saw the bears recognized it during the game. And so like the third time they or the fourth or fifth time we did it, the, Mike linebackers jumping up and down, kind of pointing at it. And I remember I was so proud of this article. I found something. It was immediate. It was timely. I posted it. I felt so good about it. And the first comment just destroyed me because it said, isn't it pretty sad that some random dude in California can figure out our offense? And that was the, it wasn't about like, Hey, this is great content. It was just like, it's pretty sad that some random dude could figure out this easily. Um, but it was, it was a phenomenal time to create content. You get instant feedback. Uh, I, I wouldn't trade anything for that time back then. And you were in your 20s at this point. Mm -hmm. You were in your 20s. Yeah, there was just something about being in, like, I was kind of the same thing where I had my, I had a full-time newspaper job and then I would like go home, eat dinner, and they'll stay up to like two or three in the morning, like working on my blog and, mm -hmm. and like, you not just writing the pieces, but then emailing other bloggers and trying to get them to write it and just like, 
you know, when I, you, you know, I'm 40 now to think about the level of energy that that took. And I just don't have that energy anymore, but there's something about being, being that young and just like being able to burn the candle at both ends. That is just like, it's amazing to like, you know, it's a great way to like get into something that you're like really interested in. Yeah. Even if it's like a side job. And like I said, the coolest part is there were so many of us that, that were doing it back then that again, we're in our mid twenties, we're, we're dating, seriously dating. And then we all get engaged and we get married. And this was again, back when it was a community, we, that's how we got to know each other. And there's some of my closest friends to this day that we kind of grew up and like did some really important things in our lives throughout communicating with these people in this chief's community. Uh, I owed everything. Uh, the feedback I was getting on those first fan posts I write gave me the confidence to continue doing it. And I wouldn't have had this media career, whatever this ride has been, had it not been for those people back at that community that were giving me confidence to be like, Hey, this is good. And they'll tell you when it's not good, (laughs) but there were enough people then that it wasn't, it was a lot less troll free. You know, there was a lot more like positive things being said and like, Hey, this is good. You should keep putting effort into this. And I did. And uh, I'll always be indebted to those people. So where did you go from there? How did your, did that involve you went to go right for bleacher report after that? Yeah. So here's the interesting long, I'll try to give the short version of this story. So uh, when I was blogging for a long time, uh, I had talked to Joel Thorman, uh, who was the, it was running uh, Arrowhead pride at that time. He and his brother, Chris had actually started it. They had both moved up uh, different points with SB nation. Chris has moved on and doing phenomenal things with the monumental sport sports network in DC, but uh, Joel oversees all of the NFL at SB nation now. So he kind of moved up from running one site to kind of running everything. And I remember talking to Joel and saying like, Hey, I'd like to move up at some point. I can't work 40 hours a week, making $400 a month. Uh, And he understood that. And again, he, there's a thing about, about five to 10 years ago about bloggers not getting paid and working for free and all those things. It never bothered me a bit. So I don't want it to come across like that. But I remember talking to Joel about like, how do I move up in this business? Cause I did have a group degree in journalism. I kind of see this is a different than what I learned in school. Like there's opportunities out here that we didn't know about. And he said, let me hook you up with uh, somebody that he had gotten to know named Field Yates at that time, had just finished being Todd Haley's assistant with the Chiefs. And he had gone to ESPN Boston to start a media career. Uh, and now Field is known as, you know, obviously one of the nicest people we've ever talked to Field is one of the nicest people in this business. Uh, but I remember walking, I was living in San Diego at the time. And I was walking through Torrey Pines. I was hiking it, talking to Field on the phone. We did not know each other. Joel had hooked up this call. And he said, my advice to you is to get in front of athletes. You need to be able to tell a story and not just blog from the outside with an opinion. If you really don't know the game, if you don't have relationships with coaches and players to get insider information, just get in front of athletes, be able to tell a story. And I was like, well, I can't get credentialed to go get in front of these athletes. Like, what would you recommend as an outside blogger with no media experience like that? He said, go to the senior bowl. He's like, go down there, you get in front of athletes, you get a chance to tell stories. So uh, it was right about what's the time. A, what's a senior bowl? So a senior bowl is um, NFL draft event with the top players in the country who are getting ready for the NFL draft, go down and compete in Mobile, Alabama for a week. It's the last time they put pads on before the draft. All of the NFL decision makers, scouts, GMs, everybody goes down there uh, and just watches basically this all-star game for a week. Uh, and the, the practices are actually more important than the game that everybody sees on TV. Those three practices, you have the best on the best going up against each other. And uh, the credential, a lot of people, like they want people covering the event. So you can go down there without a ton of experience and they give you a chance to kind of get your reps. And at that time, my wife and I were moving from San Diego back to Kansas city and this all kind of happened at the same time. And so we'd moved back to Kansas city. I was told to go to the senior bowl, uh, to get in front of athletes. And I told my wife after we moved from California to Kansas city, say, Hey, I'm going to go to the senior bowl. And if this doesn't network into something, if this doesn't lead to anything, I will go find a regular job. It's not burning me out the way that uh, I was kind of getting burnt out at that time, just working so much, went to the senior bowl, um, Cecil Lammy works uh, in radio in Denver, uh, saw me walking around like a lost puppy. And I'll always owe Cecil because he saw me wandering around having no idea what I was doing. And he just kind of said, hey, is this your first time here? I said, yes. He goes, yeah, any idea what you're doing? I said, no. He's like, perfect. Just follow us around and we'll show you how to do this. He did not know. He knew nothing about me at the time, uh, just being a good dude. And so uh, 
followed Cecil around for a few days and got, and met Matt Miller, uh, who at that time was at Bleacher Report. And now he's going on to ESPN, only lives about an hour and a half outside of Kansas City. He's one of my close friends to this day. Uh, but he had told me, he's like, hey, I've read some of your stuff on the Chiefs. Like, we should bring you over to Bleacher Report. And so he had introduced me to Dylan and a bunch of the guys that were down there at the time that were some of the decision makers at Bleacher Report because they had just gotten the Turner money that partnership had just happened. And so it was this really exciting time for them as they were expanding. Uh, they got becoming, bought by Warner Brothers Discovery, I, which owns Turner. Uh, maybe I'm, yeah, you know a lot more about this. Yeah. Than I, I just know yeah. they rented out a whole bar and they had a whole bunch of money and they were going to invest and they were going to blow up. And uh, that's what's happened. But uh, met Matt, uh, long story short, about four months later, I started writing at Bleacher Report. And so I started doing national features for them that was more storytelling and more of the things that I wanted to do, uh, which wasn't necessarily be an analyst or, you know, an opinion take guy. Uh, I love telling stories. That's what um, I really found a passion for doing. Uh, I was able to tell a handful of stories when I was at Bleacher Report. At that time, I had moved back to Kansas City. I was writing on the side at Bleacher Report. And then I got a job with a live TV production company uh, based in Kansas City. It was called Niles Media Group. And I was the production coordinator and basically did the logistics and the tech book for all these live sports broadcasts. And it really taught me the TV side of the business, um, working with the EICs and the, the directors and producers from everything from high school football in Kansas City to we put on the Jacksonville Jaguars preseason games back then. So I got to see productions at all different levels, did that for a year. And then the chief's internal reporter job opened, the team insider job opened. And one of the guys that was a producer there had actually DM me on Twitter and said, Hey, this reporter job's about to open. You should apply for this. Like we all read your stuff. We've been reading you for years. Uh, we think you'd be a good fit. You should try to get this job. And, and so sports, to, so I don't follow sports. So Mm -hmm. Because of obviously the internet and the and how easy it is to create and publish content, sports teams they as a way of marketing themselves ha are increasingly investing in con their own content teams so that they can constantly be drilling out social media posts, blog posts, videos, podcasts, and stuff like that. So they can like so there's like a you know a twenty four seven fandom that can like uh, you know subscribe to them so that that drives more interest in the teams, tickets, and stuff like that. So this was like part of that content team is you would actually be employed by the team, mm -hmm. but you would be acting almost like a journalist that could like interview the, who had more access probably than your average journalist. And stuff <laughs> yeah. Like that. yeah. Yeah. It was an interesting time looking back and trying to, to, be a beat writer. I came with a blogger with an opinion. Had a different. Had a different background than a lot of the people that um, had a lot of those jobs. And every NFL team was set up differently. Some are very conservative, and it's an extension of PR. Um, I was not hired uh, by the PR department. I was hired by the digital media department. Uh, and you work at big organizations that are all kind of set up differently. Um, but yeah, I my job when I was hired was more writing for the website and to be kind of the conduit between the fans and the organization and telling the stories that I love doing, which is telling like, how do these coaches get to the position they're in? How do these players get to the position they're in? And thankfully I was able to get some great access and, and write some phenomenal stories. Now I was at the chiefs for six years, started off as a writer, very little TV camera on camera experience, anything like that. Uh, like I said, I had worked for that live production company. I had been a sideline reporter for two division two football games. Uh, never been in a production meeting, never done anything. Apparently that was enough experience. When I went through the interview process, chiefs hired me in about three weeks after I started, I was on the sideline of a preseason game doing sideline reporting and simulcast on NFL network to a few hundred thousand people, uh, looking at the people like, what am I doing here? I do not have a lot of experience in doing this, but, uh, so the NFL network. So like I, I find sports media fascinating and like, like just like how many ways that they slice and dice sports broadcasting, right? So like NFL, obviously um, broadcast, they sell broadcasting licensing rights to like the ESPNs, the TNTs and all that kind of stuff. But they have their own also network that does that different content or is that the same content that's also on the ESPN or whatever? So for preseason, it was different. I still think they do it this way and I, I could be wrong. Uh, but the during preseason, the 
broadcasts were done in house and they were streamed through like our local, you know, at that time it was KCTV five was a local CBS affiliate that would pick up the games, but it was in house. So it was our production team uh, that kind of ran things. They would outsource, they would hire the production truck and our producer and director at that time uh, was a guy named Ryan Galvin and Andy Goldberg. Uh, and they were on the CBS one crew. So they worked with Jim Nance and Tracy Wolfson and Tony Romo, but it was preseason for them too to get reps before the regular season would begin. So you would bring in these national producer and director to come into the truck, but then all of the replay ops and all of them were all in internal people. And so uh, Trent Green was hired on the broadcast. Obviously, he does a lot with CBS, but he lives in Kansas City. He's obviously a Chiefs legend, so he would be the color analyst. They would hire a play-by-play -play guy, and they would stick me on the sideline as the internal guy because I'm staying with the players you know, up in the, the dorms during training camp because the Chiefs still get away for training camp. So I would have insight and stories that I could share during a preseason broadcast that may be more relevant than that kind of content would be during a regular season game. But uh, NFL Network then can pick up games either in the middle of game, preseason games or just say like, hey, this preseason game is going to simulcast locally through the CBS affiliate, but also on NFL Network. And I believe one of those first- Which is a streaming app. Done. Which is a streaming app of some sort. NFL Network. Yes. I don't exactly know where it went. I was just trying to figure out how to talk. Well, it's like an IFB here for the first time in my yeah. life. <laughs> but it's probably on like Roku or Apple TV or the Amazon Fire app that I can fire up that app. And if I'm a subscriber or something like that, I can watch that. Yeah. And this was back in 2014 was my first year. Oh, okay. So I don't know yeah, what so it was back yeah, then. Different than, yeah. But um, it was it was an interesting time. The first time in my life that I ever did an interview with an IFB where I have a producer talking in my ear while I'm talking to somebody else live. First time I ever did that was live on camera on the sideline of a Chiefs game. So you grew up a sports lover, grew up a Kansas City Chiefs lover, wanted to break into journalism. Is this like your dream job, basically? Yeah, I I don't know what my, my job is so different from one day to another. I think for me and kind of how KC Sports Network kind of came about and what I'm doing. No, 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 sorry, no, no oh, not this now. I'm saying, I'm saying for the working for the Kansas City Chiefs as a media, was that your dream job? Yes, absolutely. You, I was like a kid in a candy story, but imposter syndrome. I mean, every Chiefs fan that had a social media account or that blogged about him or wrote it, like every Chiefs fan would have loved that job. Uh, because of just what it was. And it was a great place to work. Um, I have nothing to say. It was, it's intense. It's high pressure. There's always a lot going on and the NFL does a phenomenal job of making it year round. Uh, there's always something right around the corner, whether it's the draft, free agency, the combine, uh, and then we're doing off season stories with the players. So it was constantly traveling. You're on the move. Uh, I stayed there for six years, but yeah, it was a phenomenal place to work. Um, it was an absolute dream job. I had, and we had kids and priorities and the things that were important just kind of changed for me. Um, and you kind of see the long term, like, hey, what is what does my job look like in 10 years? Where can I go from what I'm doing right now as kind of that that grind, that drive to to stay up for 15 hours and break down film and those kinds of things changed uh, when I had kids. And then it was, OK, what does my job look like now? Because uh, my job at the end of my time with the chiefs was completely different than when I got hired. It, it moved away from writing and it got to the point where it's like, we don't care about writing. Let's create video. Cause that's where people are going. Social video, sponsored assets, figure out a way to, to turn everything you're doing into video. Uh, so it could be monetized in that way from a business perspective. And so, um, yeah, it, it was a crazy ride. I got to see the, the industry change when I was blogging as an outsider and then obviously be a team insider and see how they handled media. I feel like by the time I was done with my Chiefs career, I had a pretty good perspective on media from a lot of different angles. So your reason for leaving is like you just could not travel with you wanted to like you didn't want to be traveling all the time with the team and you wanted to like. You And also you felt like you couldn't grow. You wanted to do something different. Yeah, I was doing a lot of video editing. Like I said, it was a great place to work. It's just I got in there to tell stories and to be like that conduit between the fans and the players to where I felt like if you tell a really good story and every player that's in the NFL has got a really good story. That's probably all athletes everywhere. Uh, but I loved being able to tell a story to where that – fan that watches it will root for that player not because he's wearing the jersey of the team that they root for because they feel like they know a little bit about him or how he got there and if you can make that emotional connection that fandom becomes that much stronger 
And I took that part of my job very seriously and I loved doing it. By the time I was done um, my last year with the Chiefs, a lot more of that was through the phenomenal video people uh, that we had, our 65 TPT production crew. They would go and tell those stories. They weren't necessarily written stories anymore. They were video. And they're such a good video production team that I that's not what I did. I, I was not what I enjoy doing was all the video editing and a lot of that stuff isn't um, the same passion that I had. So it was, it was a number of different things, but uh, the traveling was a lot of it. I mean, every other week I was gone. Uh, I couldn't go to all my kids games. And at that time they were four and two and I saw it coming. And I talked to a lot of people uh, that had been in a similar situation and um, you know, you miss a lot of things and there's give and take. It's a phenomenal experience, but it just, for me at that time, it was like, Hey, I'm ready for something different. Uh, I'm ready to be home a little bit more. Uh, and see what this becomes and um, see where my media career would go from there. And what year did you leave the Chiefs? Uh, 2020. So it was right when COVID picked up. It was right after their first Super Bowl win over the 49ers down in Miami. Uh, it was like that August, I believe, uh, during that whole COVID season. Uh, it was right at the the beginning of that. And you briefly went and worked for like some other media company or something. Yeah, this company called Let It Fly Media uh, since been acquired, but it was a creative video production company. Uh, a few of the people I'd worked with at the Chiefs that had left before me actually were working there. I had, uh, knew one of the, the co-founders. Uh, we knew each other before uh, he had started that business and they were into the, the content game in a very impactful, cool way with the content that they were promoting and uh, with NIL kind of growing. It was like, hey, we're going to be we're going to have you be this director of athlete content. And I went there, we were able to do some really cool things, but with NIL, you know, even three, four years later now still being kind of a mess in a lot of ways, um, as far as how it's all gonna work long-term, um, what they had hired me for didn't, didn't really work. And at that time I had started KC Sports Network when I was working there and it, it started to do really well. And it's more along the lines of what I wanted to do. So just kind of went with that. So tell me about that. So like what, what was the initial, very first iteration of content you were creating for what what became the you know the company that you run now it's funny because and it's how uh, familiar with you and the great work that you do with your newsletter but it was substack uh it was we were of all places we were back at the senior bowl uh was down there uh actually with the company that i was working for before uh at let it fly media and went down there to just meet people and talk to agents and just kind of network and matt miller who at that time I think was at ES, he had gone to ESPN at that point. We were talking with him uh, about Substack because he had started his own Substack newsletter and he explained just kind of how the business side of it worked and that Substack really doesn't take that much money off the top. And then you start doing some math about like how many people would it take for us uh, if we joined forces. And there were about four of us in that meeting that had created, we've known each other a long time. We had created cheese content for a long time. So this, like, wait, hey, so we, this was four people who had worked at the chiefs or just people you had, you had variously known at various like outlets that were covering it. Like Arrowhead pride original, like back in when we got started at Arrowhead pride, they had, they had blogged, the we had blogged together. Blog. Okay, yeah. Yes. So we had blogged together at Arrowhead pride and I had gone on to work with the chiefs and then left the chiefs and we all stayed friends. And then they were looking for a change uh, of where they were at with things. And we all just it happened. It was probably one 30 in the morning and Matt Miller was explaining Substack to all of us. And the light bulb just kind of went off of what if we all just combined and did a Substack and you could throw a podcast all of a sudden, like literally within like a minute, it's like, that's a network. It was like, we can start this, but the financial beginning of it be began with Substack, which now looking back is funny because it's a part of what we do, but it's, it's a small part of what we do. What? It's really the what that newsletter? thing is going for us. Yeah. What's a, what's a small part of the newsletter? The newsletter from a financial perspective of how it's working with everything else that we're doing, the, the newsletter has become a, a small piece, but it's really what we all first broke down and was like, listen, if we can get you know, if we have 25,000 people that are reading all of us individually right now with the stuff that we do, how many of what percentage of those people do you think would be willing to pay 30 bucks a year to get access to the things that we write if we all combine together? Hi there, Simon here. So that's the end of the free preview for this episode. If you want to listen to or watch the full episode, you have to become a paid subscriber to my Substack. When you subscribe, you get an automated email that allows you to book a half hour introductory phone call with me. Subscribers also get the full length interviews with some of the world's most successful media entrepreneurs. You can watch the video version, read the transcript, or upload the audio feed to your favorite podcast player. 
To subscribe, go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter.